The local time, everyone. I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's digital minister. I'm really happy to be here virtually to answer your questions from the Harvard Business School. First question: Could you talk to us about your early education, formative experiences, and personal journey that led you to your professional career? Gladly. My earliest memory was when I was four years old.、Uh, it's very formative. I overheard、uh, the doctors telling my parents that this child, that's me, have maybe a fifty percent chance of surviving until the heart surgery. So for the first twelve years of my life, before I got a heart surgery to correct the、uh, birth defect, my blood flow, oxygen flow, is much reduced. When I feel angry or I feel very happy,、um, I would faint. And so I learned very early on as a survival skill、uh, to be calm, to breathe deeply and intentionally, and also to be nonviolent. And what it also means is that it's instilled in me a norm of publish before I perish. Still to this day, before I go to sleep, I make sure that I publish into the commas,、um, this video, of course, but also、um, the interviews that I got from journalists and、uh, lobbyist visits, even the internal cross-ministerial meetings that I chair. I make sure that I publish everything、uh, into the commas so that people who want to remix to work based on whatever we have worked on would not have to wait until my permission because after I may not wake up the next day, and also not wait for seventy-five years or something、uh, for the copyright to expire. Now this norm、uh, works also very well with the early internet norms. While I was recovering from the surgery in the early nineties, I encountered this nowadays we call open access movement, the archive A R X I V community, the early free software communities, are all predicated upon the idea of open knowledge of people sharing with random strangers, and I remember reading、uh, those preprints, writing to the researchers, receiving an email, and thought. Well,、um, I don't have to wait until I get a PhD or something. I can contribute to science, and also、uh, the textbooks that I was reading、uh, in high school seems woefully out of date, at least ten years out of date. So I told my teachers I want to quit school and start my education on the World Wide Web. And surprisingly, the head of my school said, "Okay, go for it." So、um, when I was fifteen. And later on, I would found many internet startups.、Uh, one of the first startup, Inforian,、uh, worked on C two C auctions, something like eBay in the early internet.、Uh, and I also participated in the standard making community, the IETF,、uh, which is based on the idea of rough consensus, civic participation, and running code.、Uh, so this became my professional career. I got very interested. Into the phenomena of swift trust on the internet. Why do people trust random strangers over the internet when it would easily take months of face-to-face -face interaction、uh, before the internet for people to do something together? But also swift distrust. Why would、uh, digital design that is antisocial、uh, render previous friends、uh, into enemies? Why would it lead to polarization and conspiracy theories? So that fascinates me, and in a sense, that was my research topic and my professional career、uh, for the past sixteen years and counting. The birth of the current digital democracy movement seemed to have originated with the Sunflower Movement in twenty fourteen. How did that happen? Well. In March 18 that year, a bunch of students occupied Taiwan's Parliament Building and stayed there nonviolently for around three weeks. At the time, the MPs were refusing to deliberate substantially the cross-strait service and trade agreement with Beijing, and so the students were doing a demo. I guess it's a demonstration in the sense of showing how half a million people on the street, many more online. Can have a point by point conversation around the trade agreement, with the help of around twenty NGOs. For example, in a corner、uh, around the Occupy Parliament, people were deliberating around whether to allow into our the new four G infrastructure, 
uh, the so-called private sector from the Beijing regime. Now, of course, the entire world will have similar conversations around 5G a few years down the line. But at the time, uh, Taiwan was the only place that I know of that have this digitally facilitated conversation around this topic and many other topics. Now, uh, I'm part of the G0V or Gov0 team, which worked uh, with the cable and radio and power providers to make sure that people who could not make it to the Occupy Parliament nevertheless participate substantially to the conversation. Not only uh, we set up the live streaming about the Occupy Parliament so that facts spreads faster than rumors, we also work on tools um, that allow people to enter their company registration number or whatever business they're in and find out which part of the CSSTA affects them. In short, we were providing the fabric based by objective data that allowed listening and scale to happen. And after three weeks, the Occupy was a success. The head of the parliament ratified the common values, the common demands of the occupiers. And at the end of that year, in the mayoral election, all the mayoral candidates that supported the Sunflower Movement well, got elected, sometimes surprisingly, even to themselves. And the people who did not support the civic movement well, simply did not get elected as mayors. And after the election, um, including myself, many civic tech people and facilitators were then recruited into the cabinet as reverse mentors. Young people uh, that nevertheless mentors the cabinet members into the listening experiences that we set up during the Sunflower to make sure that on emerging topics such as Uber, so-called sharing economy or gig economy, a similar um, digital democracy movement can be employed to make sure that the taxi drivers, Uber drivers, passengers of all sorts and so on uh, are having a real face-to-face -face as well as online conversation to set up the common norms around well, ride sharing at that time. And we would went on uh, to go through the V Taiwan projects and the hackathon to tackle around two dozen uh, national level laws and regulations and successfully pass them as bills or regulations. So that was uh, my early experiment uh, into e-rule making before getting, I guess, promoted from a reverse mentor to full-time minister in the same office in October 2016. What, in your opinion, led a one-time event, a very unique Occupy movement, to become a catalyst for a change in the way that the government deals with citizens? Well, I think nonviolence is the most important one. Because of its nonviolent nature, we showed that it is actually possible to de-escalate what would have been a large protest in many other jurisdictions around the world into something that is co-creating. By showing that through the live streaming, nobody would like to incite a violence by showing that through real-time transcription and translations, we can include voices that could not make easy use of websites. We made sure that the career public service see the Sunflower model as a legitimate way of rulemaking. So in a sense, by agreeing to become reverse mentors, we were saying that we're not working against the system, but neither are we working for the government. We're working with the government and want to invite the government to trust the citizens. And this is the most important thing, because once the career public service can see that citizens are trustworthy, that instead of just noise and protests, the citizens who care can often bring about very innovative solutions to the common issues, then they would be um, okay to say, yeah, about this Uber thing, the Ministry of Transportation was having one idea, but the Ministry of Labor were thinking very differently, the Ministry of Economy thinking also very differently, but, but that is fine. It is okay to move from the traditional consultation stage, which is only after the agenda is set, 
to the pre-agenda setting stage where the ministries were all having very different agenda and we simply asked the citizens okay what what do you feel about a private driver with no professional license driving to work picking up strangers that they met through an app and charging them for it how do you feel so by moving from the interpretation or regulation based consultation to the consultation about authentic experiences and feelings. We make sure that the public service see this as something that is essentially risk-free. When people share their own feelings, you may feel happy and they may feel upset and that is entirely fine. But after a while, usually three weeks, we see very plainly that most people agree with most each other's feelings on most of the things, most of the time. It was just that on the more anti-social corners of social media, people were spending their attention on the most divisive part, the ideologies around particular things. But through the Sunflower V Taiwan inspired facilitation, we simply create pro-social and safe spaces. You can think of it as a public square or a town hall or a park or a campus in the digital realm. And then people tend to converge on good enough consensus instead of on divisive ideologies. So for the career public service, this improves their legitimacy instead of taking away their legitimacy. How does a citizen interact with the different systems and processes that comprise digital democracy? Well, in Taiwan, there's a single website, join.gov.tw, that enjoys more than 30 million visits in a country of 23 million uh, that combines participatory budgeting, petitioning, uh, regulatory pre-announcement, uh, budget overview and accountability, auditing, many other things. So for example, petition. Uh, as soon as a proposal collects more than 5,000 electronic signatures, uh, we hold the meetings with the petitioner and twice a month, the participation officers, the people in each and every ministry in charge of engaging the public, vote. And the top voted uh, issues are given to collaborative interagency meetings. And we actually travel to where the petitioners are, if it's a local issue, and start a multi-stakeholder consultation, similar to the VTOWN process, that enables people to co-create, not just protest. Uh, for example, um, people under 18 were very active on the joint platform. Uh, one of the most popular petitions to ban plastic straws in our national identity drink takeout, bubble tea, uh, was started by someone who just turned 17. Uh, and there's also a petition back in 2017 about the tax filing experience, which were, and I quote, explosively hostile uh, to the petitioner. Uh, on Mac and Linux systems. So we co-created the text filing experience in 2018. But because the participation offices are from all different ministries, so when we talk about the tax reform, for example, it could be the Coast Guard uh, participation officer holding the breakout groups. But when we talk about the fishing and ocean policy, well, it could be the tax agency participation officer holding the facilitation. And the reason why is that although they are professionally trained public servants, they are on the citizen side. The Coast Guard perhaps also file tax themselves. Um, the tax agency person also likes to fish and surf in their spare time. And so for the citizens that participate in the online and face-to-face -face conversation, it's just like the participation office are one of them, right? They're one of the citizens. They could actually start a petition themselves under a pseudonym uh, and in enabled us to listen across silos and build to foster a co-creative culture. 
Of course, it doesn't need to be on the national platform join.gov.tw. G0V has its own platform join.g0v.tw. So just change the O to a zero and you get into the shadow government uh, where people look at the digital services by the government that ends in something GOVTW and make shadow forks of the official versions under open source and creative common licenses as something that G0V. The TW. So, for example, the budget visualization was the inaugural GovZero project. And because it's open source, we merged it in 2016 into the joint platform. And during the pandemic, uh, not just the mask visualization platform, but also the contact tracing platform based on SMS uh, in a privacy enhancing multi party design were all contributed by people in the joint G0V. The TW platform that enabled Taiwan, a country of 23 million people, um, to enjoy uh, at the time of recording less than 1,000 casualties uh, during the pandemic without a single day of lockdowns. So we relied on the social sector to contribute to the digital public infrastructures. How do you maintain a sense of empowerment? Well, I believe that instead of asking the citizen to trust the government, the government should trust the citizens. And we show the trust by improving the bandwidth of democracy and reducing the latency of democracy. For example, back in 2020, when we were rationing out the masks, we make sure that we publish the real-time inventory of more than 6,000 pharmacies so that people queuing in line can see immediately whether this pharmacy is running out of masks and they should queue somewhere else. Now, if we publish only the statistics every quarter or even every week, then it is not enough bandwidth. Only when we publish a pod collection every 30 seconds, can people build hundreds of different tools like a distributed ledger that showed via chatbots, via maps, via voice assistance that helps people who were queuing in line to reduce their fear, uncertainty, and doubt when it comes to availability of masks. But also, when bias is detected, the latency, the time between the detection and the fix is also paramount. If it takes a quarter, to fix an issue, then people would not feel empowered when they point out the problems. Indeed, very early on when we rationed out the mask, we erroneously thought that the pharmacies align perfectly with population centers. So each person in Taiwan, on average, is of a very similar distance to a available mask, and we thought it was good. But according to the civic technologists at an open street map community, that was not the case because not everyone owned a helicopter. So what's the same distance on the map is very different uh, compared to the opportunity cost. If someone has to take a bus, for example, uh, versus metro or driving, it all ends in very different accessibility. So by the time someone in the rural area reached the pharmacy, even though it's the same distance on the map, um, it already ran out of mask. So it's uh, inequity. So after the OpenStreetMap community's picture gets surfaced by a member of the parliament, MP Eng Gao, to the minister Chen Shizhong of Health and Welfare, the minister simply said, well, legislator teaches. And that was not rhetorical because MP Gao was VP of data analytics at Foxconn. So she knows something about data. Uh, and so she did provide very valuable suggestions. And just after 24 hours, we changed the way we distribute the mask to the pharmacies based on the actual opportunity cost. And we also introduced pre-registration and collection on 24 hour um, convenience stores, more than 12,000 of them. And so early through real time open data, open API, can we turn those critiques into co-creators and we make sure, no matter whether it's mask rationing or the SMS-based contact tracing, we do it in a way that's swift and safe. It's swift because it saves everyone time, but it's safe and harmless because the pre-registration based on apps and website and so on does not substitute 
the queuing in pharmacy. So if you do not want to use a website, you can always walk to your local pharmacy um, or local convenience store as well. And the contact tracing, although very successful based on SMS and QR code, if you do not like to use a phone, always you can ride your way or stem your way into a venue. Again, it's all by harmless coexistence. How do you get the powerful government leaders to pay attention and actually listen in a way that scales? Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president, said a very inspiring statement in 2016 in her inauguration speech. She said, Before, we think of democracy as a showdown between two opposing values. But now, democracy must become a conversation between many diverse values. So by focusing on the common ground between the diverse positions and by focusing on the social innovations that can foster those common ground in a way that is good enough for everyone, that everyone can live with, this is very powerful. Instead of taking this side or that side, in a digital democracy, we can actually listen to all the different sides in a pro-social social media. So back to the Uber example in 2015, for example, instead of debating about the abstract ideologies like is this sharing economy, is it gig economy, and so on, we simply focus on very specific examples. Someone who drives to work, who pick up strangers, they met over the phone, charging them for it without driver license, that's professional, and so on. And so it turns out that everyone feels pretty much the same around this, these issues. So people care deeply about not undercutting existing taxi fare. People care about registration and also about insurance. People care about empowering local temples and churches so that the co-ops have the same access to the surge pricing and app-based dispatch that Uber enjoys and so on. And really, Nobody's against that. Everyone can live with it. So listening in a way that scales is by empowering the career public service with the sort of tools that produces this common ground. And once the government leaders know that this is a reliable way to get to the common ground, which we have proven uh, with over 100 collaborative meetings across sectors, not a single one turned violent, not a single one turned into a ideological debate. And so because of this track record, it's now as easy as starting a survey, starting a poll or something, except this survey or poll is co-created by the people who are closest to the front line, closest to pain. And this, of course, is the power of social sector that is an implicit outside game. So that if at the end of the day, the government leader do not adhere to the norms that pretty much everyone, regardless of party, have already worked on. Well, then maybe they will lose the next mayoral election. And this is why all the four major parties in Taiwan have signed on the Open Parliament Partnership Agreement, and they compete on being even more open, even more transparent, even more democratic, and nobody wants to go back to the bad old days of just a few people speaking to millions of people, but no way for millions of people to listen to one another. What would you recommend as guiding principles for applying the lessons you have learned to a larger and more complex society, even for global cooperation? Well, but we're already part of a global cooperation around digital public infrastructures. In addition of serving as a digital minister at TW, I also serve as board member to seven social innovation organizations across the globe uh, to work on democratization in various other jurisdictions. So it's a little bit like be water, uh, where you don't have to call it the Taiwan model, you can call it the New Zealand model or the Estonian model or the Icelandic model. Indeed, the joint platforms uh, e-petition uh, was a direct adaptation of Better Reykjavik uh, from Iceland. And our participatory budgeting design is heavily inspired 
by Consul and Decidim um, from uh, Madrid and Barcelona. And we also uh, learned the Polis uh, system, which is the Uber um, resolution system, the pro-social social media from Seattle and so on. So it's already international. Now, uh, we also include uh, non-national jurisdictions such as Ethereum. Uh, so I serve as a fellow board member with Vitalik Buterin in Radical Exchange. And we apply the principles we have learned from the Ethereum jurisdiction uh, to Taiwan as our presidential hackathon. For four years now, we apply quadratic voting, which is first prototyped in Ethereum, uh, into our national agenda setting around the Sustainable Development Goals. So each year, more than 200 different civic tech teams propose their ideas about the SDGs, and each person with a Taiwanese SMS number receives 99 points. And you can allocate them uh, quadratically to your pet project, but you will soon find out that if you vote uh, one vote that costs you one point, two votes, four points, three votes, nine points. So with 99 points, the most you can do is vote nine votes, which costs 81. And with 18 left, you will probably look at some other projects to find some synergies. And then maybe you do a four, uh, which is 16 points, and then you have two left. So you're incentivized to look at at least four projects. And you can also take some of the points back. Maybe you do a seven and seven and so on. Um, and so after the voting, we discover that because the uh, marginal return, the impact, is the same as marginal cost of each vote, people tend to feel they have won regardless of the top 20 outcome of the quadratic voting. Because out of the five or seven projects they have voted, well, some made it uh, to the top 20, but even the ones that did not, well, they know which uh, teams in the top 20 they want to contribute to because the synergies revealed by quadratic voting is public. And so because of this, um, people then focus on building the cross-sectoral partnerships to realize the presidential hackathon team's goals. And after a few months of prototyping locally, um, five teams receive this trophy from our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, who is the shape of the Taiwan with the micro projector underneath. If you turn it on, it projects the president giving you the trophy and promising whatever you did locally for the past three months and validated by quadratic voting will become public policy in the next fiscal year with all the personnel, budget, and also regulatory support required. And this is how we scale the local social innovations through a novel voting system from the Ethereum jurisdiction uh, in a way that scales um, nationally. And in the past few years, we also have an international track. What advice would you give to students graduating from Harvard Business School on how they can make a difference in the world in the next 10 years? Well, be the difference you want to see in the world. And whenever you feel that there's a right side and there's a wrong side, try to think in non-binary. Try to take both, take all the sides. Indeed, in my line of work, if I see that a few sides are obviously correct and some other side is obviously wrong, I always think that it's my problem. I would spend time with the side that I couldn't argue for and spend time with them on a ethnographic mode, just hanging out with them uh, until I can also see the world from their side and argue their case. And this is important because only then can we leave no one behind and say that the co-creation we just did is good enough for everyone? And if it's too polarized, if there's too much tension uh, in my mind, I would simply sleep on it. I would read all the materials without passing judgment. And then I just go to sleep without setting an alarm clock. And after eight hours, or nine hours if it's really complex, I almost always wake up with, well, a holistic view on things so that I can say, oh, this is actually a common ground between all those different sides. 
And so I would recommend people who want to be change agents, who want to make difference in the world, practice non-binary thinking and take all the sides and sleep on it until you make it. What should leaders do to ensure that new technologies are used for pro-social goals rather than to exacerbate the inequality and lack of cohesion in society? Well, my recommendation is to trust your fellow citizens. Whatever product or service you're working on, instead of thinking your fellow citizens as consumers or as subjects and so on, make sure that they also participate in making the refinements, but also surprising combinations, mods, modifications to your service and products. And this requires a change in thinking from delivering the perfect solution to just a good enough one. A good enough solution is required so that the communities can engage with you. If everything you do is perfect, well, there really is no room for the communities to enter. So publish early, release often, and make sure that whenever you see a innovation that builds upon yours, well, instead of saying, oh, it's not invented here, simply say, oh, we trust our fellow citizens. They have a better idea. So it's the social sector that sets the norm. It is the public sector that amplifies the norm. And it's the private sector leaders that makes those norms stick by making sure that they can scale out, they can scale up, and they can scale deeply. Based on those privacy-enhancing, democracy-affirming technologies, we can then create a paradigm of plurality where each and every one of us is open to new designs and innovations from our descendants, from the next generations, instead of aiming to maximize um, our control or maximize some individual liberty or maximize any arbitrary thing uh, and foreclosing uh, the possibilities of our next generations. So to conclude, uh, I would read my job description, which tells the difference between a IT maximalist thinking uh, to a pluralist thinking based on digitalization. It goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening. Live long and prosper.